So our guest today, Jessica Marie Johnson, is an assistant professor in the Department of History at the Johns Hopkins University. Her work has appeared in Slavery and Abolition, The Black Scholar, Meridians, Feminism, Race and Transnationalism, American Quarterly, Social Texts, the Journal of African American History, Debates in the Digital Humanities, Forum Journal, Bitch Magazine, Black Perspectives, Somatosphere, and Postcolonial Digital Humanities. Johnson is a historian of Atlantic slavery and the Atlantic African diaspora. She is the author of Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World, and editor of Slavery in the Machine. She is founding cur curatrix of African Diaspora PhD, co-organizer of the Queering Slavery Working Group, a member of the Latin Negros Project, and a digital alchemist at the Center for Solutions to Online Violence. As a historian, Johnson researches Black diasporic freedom struggles from slavery to emancipation, as a digital humanist, Johnson explores ways digital and social media disseminate and create historical narratives, in particular, comparative histories of slavery and people of African descent. She is the recipient of research fellowships and awards from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, the Gilder Lehrman Institute, the Richard Civil War Era Center, and Africana Research Center at the Pennsylvania State University, and the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship Program in the program in African-American history at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Hello, everyone. I hope everybody has been having and surviving COVID okay and um, having a soft landing into the new semester. Um, thank you for that introduction. It's really exciting to be here. It's great to um, meet everybody. I, um, you have my introduction. So what I'm going to do is sort of um, talk to you a little bit about the book. I actually love that there are so many people here who are interested in um, aesthetics and performance. Um, I, one of the things that I um, was thinking through and in, in when I was doing the book, um, when I was writing is, is how to make it um, useful and important, relevant, interesting to those who are in some realm of performance studies, who are in some realm of, of, of culture and cultural studies, um, because that's so important to how we think about and how we research Black women and um, Black freedom, um, not only in the archives that we have access to, but also in the kinds of um, lenses that we lend to that, to that archive. And so hopefully I'll talk a little bit about that um, in just a second. So um, what I'll do is I'll do just um, a short sort of rundown of the book um, and just an overview because I think that you guys have already read it. Um, so I will not hopefully bore you guys with rereading it with you. Uh, and then um, we can open it up for some questions and um, the questions can range. I'm happy to answer questions about the book. I'm also happy to answer questions that are about the making of the book, researching it, and engaging with the archive, um, the professoriate, whatever else. This is, um, you know, um, I am a tenure track assistant professor. So this is my first book, um, the tenure book. So there's also, I'm sure, plenty of questions around what that looks like. Um, I think everybody here is a grad student. Everybody may not be interested in professoriate, but, you know, we can chat about all kinds of things. Um, uh, and uh, and yeah, and so we'll we'll proceed that way. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen right now. Unless there's any questions about any of that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, so the title of my book is, as you know, we get flesh black women intimacy and freedom in the Atlantic world. Um, so I myself am. Um, I describe myself as a uh, historian of Atlantic slavery uh, and African diaspora. So my research is really rooted in historical in inquiry, um, but it also draws from methods and theories and concerns that actually might feel more familiar to those who are in interdisciplinary fields, um, as this room can attest, um, to those who are in women's studies, ethnic studies, black studies, um, cultural studies. Uh, and the reason I do that is, is deliberate. I am, you know, 
trained PhD in history. Uh, my BA is actually in African African American studies. Um, and I found that in researching and trying to understand the lives of enslaved and free women of African descent, the lives of black women, uh, particularly in the early modern era, it was important to um, to make sure that the historical work I do is diving ever more deeply into the human condition of which questions of blackness and sexuality, bodies and power, um, the diaspora and its many archipelagos um, are all apart. Um, it's important, I believe, to be promiscuous in this work um, and promiscuous about our methods and our theories. Uh, and to that extent, I'm, I'm sort of committed to using any tool I can find to, that will allow me to illuminate Black women's lives in, in this earlier period. Uh, so uh, that said, though, I, um, I like archives a lot. Um, I'm fascinated by how and when and where Black women will appear in the archive. Um, and so one of the themes in Wicked Flesh um, is a water theme and the ways um, and, and structure um, trying to move with women. <laughs> oh, excuse me move with women in the archive, um, not as like, you know, um, opening a door in which um, they're all in a room together and you walk in and you chat with them, but more as um, like, like water, like um, moving with them through the flows of history, when and where they appear, um, and relinquishing them where, um, where they don't. Um, I use, um, you know, these are archives that are 18th century archives, a world in which sort of our modern day conceptions of race and gender and sexuality. Um, this book is a lot about like how that, those conceptions, um, the history of that, those conceptions becoming a reality. Um, so I use black as a kind of umbrella category for African women and women, of, uh, for Africans and people of African descent. Um, and I use women broadly as a category for what we might today um, break down further into cis, trans, um, and a spectrum of, of, of femme and femme-identified um, people. In fact, a lot of the um, work of the book implicitly is trying to think about how to write a history of Black women that is not also tied to gendered binaries um, or gender binaries of, of the body. And what does that mean to do that in an earlier period? And so I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, I'm also... Um, I'm fascinated by, in a lot of ways, uh, the questions of ephemerality, the questions of the contingent, uh, and the questions of the extraordinary, which I think all are part of how we tell stories of Black women's history. So the ephemeral in the sense of, again, like where and when um, Black women in their lives sort of surface and um, appear and reappear, um, appear and disappear, but also, um, you know, the contingent as in the circumstances that really turn Black women's lives on a pivot. So one of the um, uh, uh, the the sort of guiding posts of African American thought is an essay by Earl Lewis, "The Turn Is on a Pivot." That to understand African American history, well, to understand U.S. history, one must actually understand African American history, and that U.S. history turns as a pivot on that on the experiences of Black people in the U.S. Um, I think a similar thing um, applies when we're thinking about Black women in a broader diasporic context, especially in a world in which um, the reproduction of slavery is so much tied to how we think about the reproduction, um, legally was tied to the reproduction of, um, of, of enslaved children of, of, and, the, and the commodification of Black women's wounds. Um, and then there's the extraordinary, um, which I don't think we can get away from. I think we're still fascinated, at least as historians, with extraordinary figures that appear in the archive, the names and the biographies that we can follow, the stories that surface that seem so exceptional in this world where um, we're to believe that Africans are chattel and, and, and dominated and debased. Um, and so the extraordinary is also this important piece of thinking about how we talk about Black women's narratives, Black women's stories, how do we understand the role of the extraordinary and the, the position that extraordinary figures that we find when we find them, when we're lucky enough to find them play um, in, in the work that we do. All right. All right, so the book is structured um, and moves uh, and, uh, from um, the 1670s, 1680s into the 19th century, and it moves in a kind of, again, fluid way from Senegal to the Americas, 
um, with you know roots through the Caribbean, roots all around kind of the Atlantic Rim. Um, one of the things that was important to me was to sort of um, not necessarily tell a fully linear narrative, like definitely tell a story of from past to present, um, but also to more importantly, in fact, than also, but more importantly, to tell a story in which uh, the chronology follows Black women and their experiences. So <clears throat> a lot of the ways that we talk about sort of the emergence of empire and colonialism is like, it's this arc. There's an era of sort of um, uh, chaos and um, privateering and buccaneers and um, um, European men who are not sure what they'll find, but are hoping, you know, maybe for, if not blood and glory, maybe some kind of plantation economy. And then there's a rise of plantation, an arc of that. And then there's the um, inevitable dissolution of the plantation. Uh, and most sort of um, stories of the early modern world sort of follow this broad arc um, of some kind. Um, one of the things that you find, particularly when you um, first step off um, the boat and look at the history of New Orleans is that New Orleans doesn't follow that that clean arc in any kind of way. There's really nothing um, that New Orleans does that is not full of contradictions and um, messy realities of of life in a, on the Gulf Coast. Um, New Orleans is is subject the Gulf Coast is subject to two empires, French and Spanish, before settling, um, being, before being purchased by the U.S. and becoming part of what we know now as U.S. Empire. Um, it is um, it, there's a rise and fall of plantation uh, economies almost so rapidly to be missed um, by 1730s. There's uh, no um, plantation cash crop, um, lucrative at least to speak of, and the French crown has sort of decided that Louisiana is, is not that much of interest uh, and divest itself of supporting it and of, of offering it resources. And then, you know, so there's a kind of like, like, like a little arc and then it sort of slows down. And then the Spanish come in and they're not even really remotely interested in plantation economies. They're certainly interested in um, the Gulf Coast as a strategic and military space on um, this edge of the North American continent. Uh, and uh, that means that they make other kinds of decisions that um, have to do with an interesting expansion of administrative figures and um, changes to, manu to manumission policy, the policies that allow for freedom. So there are all these kind of, of interludes and shifts and changes and what seems like it should be this um, um, this homogenous, you know, flow of from slavery to freedom, from um, colony to nation, from outpost to plantation, um, and um, and this is a location that sort of rebuffs all of that. So there's a lot of overlapping chronologies in the text, a lot of overlapping contingencies. Um, I would love, you know, if somebody wants to ask me, I'm happy to talk about how that um, got worked out in the actual writing of it, because that was. That was interesting. Um, but it, what it means is that we have a text that for about the first three chapters, uh, a lot of the work is centered on um, the African continent and what's happening in Senegambia. Um, what are the ways that the, what is, what are the ways and what is the African world that uh, the enslaved women are arriving from? Um, and what are the ways we can understand that as a prelude uh, and more of a foundation for thinking about freedom, intimacy, and kinship uh, than what's happening and what, what arrives across the Atlantic? Uh, so the first chapter is, is situated in Senegambia and talks a lot about, um, let me see, there we go, yeah. First chapter is situated in Senegambia and talks a lot about what is happening at the Coastal Comtoise of Saint Louis and Goré, about the ways that the French um, are having to navigate themselves as essentially renters and sort of um, tenants at these two islands that are of essentially little interest for Wolof polities who are claiming hegemony over the region, but are of great interest to the French as sites, uh, as bases for trade and possible you know, diplomatic interaction. Uh, and the bridge between the French 
and um, the Wolof in the countryside um, ends up being um, African women uh, engaging in trade with the French, um, engaging as middle women essentially and um, property owners at the Comtois uh, and as well as um, wives and consorts of uh, French officials, uh, particularly uh, Mariage à la mode du pays, which is marriage um, in the manner of the country. Uh, African women are able to kind of create this um, in-between space between uh, the Atlantic world that is over here, that is um, it, it, that the French are hoping to find ways to dominate imperially, and the countryside that you know the, the Wolof are also trying to find ways to dominate um, and have uh, hegemony as much as possible. Uh, part of the story that's told in these first chapters is about the ways that uh, African women um, exist in this world that is Brit that is cushioned between two. Uh, patriarchal cultures. Uh, the Wolof uh, have spaces, as I described in the book, for uh, uh, Wolof women to have some control over their own um, um, lineages, households, compounds. Um, there are positions of power that are available to Wolof women and in gear um, as, as powerful relatives, mothers, um, aunts, um, headwives, etc. because it's a polygynous society, but it's still um, patriarchal and the extent to which uh, African women form um, alliances and are able to serve as, as, as bridges between the French and um, Wolof emissaries, um, a lot of that is, um, is at, at subject to um, the rules of, of gendered engagement that are already existing in the coast until a certain point. And one of the things the book uh, looks through when it, go back to this chapter, um, one of the things that um, I talk about in the next chapter, uh, Born of This Place, are the ways that there is this kind of um, interesting moment where African women, um, Wolof women, women at the Comtois begin to make claims, not necessarily as the uh, relatives or as kinfolk of, of different aristocrats within the countryside, but as um, women who are born of this place, women who have a stake in inheritance, in um, getting inheritance from um, their husbands or their fathers or for their sons because they are born at Saint Louis and Goye. Um, they are uh, the um, sort of founding generation uh, and are the those who make the claim to be a part of the founding generation uh, of folk of of of, of uh, coastal community um, at these comtois. Um, and this is part of how they are, they begin to make a stake um, as, um, as those who are um, the ones who should be negotiated with, who should be seen as the traders, who, um, who the trading company needs to um, have access to in order to hire employees, who the trading company had better not sell their slaves across the Atlantic or else it will be a problem. Um, and that applies broadly in this chapter. There are in instances of intimate violence that uh, these women are also able to find some redress for um, in some very, you know, um, in very specific ways. They're able to do that because they begin to create a kind of stake in what it means to be of this place, of this place on the Louis Galais, of this place, this this middle ground between French and um, French and African. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that's clear, of course, and becomes important if we're going to move across the Atlantic, is that there are other people at this coast that are not necessarily able to make that, make that claim. They're not necessarily able to say, I have this stake in this place in the same way and have it have the same status as, um, as the women like, you know, for instance, Marie Bode, we can talk about in question and answer. Um, and that's the category of women who are um, sent across the Atlantic, who um, come um, or arrive at San Louis or Gore or Rufis or the other escals uh, via the uh, trading ships, uh, the trading boats, and who are um, marked and meant to be for sale um, for um, into the French um, Atlantic world. Uh, and so uh, the third chapter is about uh, about gender commodification and the long middle passage. And it's about this particular slave trade. And I actually have, what's great about looking at Louisiana's Gulf Coast, 
we can come back to that for those who are interested in aesthetics and um, dress. What's interesting about looking at Louisiana um, and the Gulf Coast is that we actually have um, we have a very specific diaspora that we can speak to and a very specific um, sort of subset of slave trade uh, that happens during the French era, at least. Now, the Spanish era does have, a, um, also reopens the slave trade. But basically, the French slave trade to Louisiana is from 1719 to 1743, as you see here. And there's only one ship, that's this little this little one here um, that comes in those years after 17, 1730. So what that means is that in some ways, this is like a, a, an African diaspora history dream to have a concentrated um, archive and data set of who is coming across the Atlantic, when they're coming and have it be in such a tight time period that we actually can draw um, some conclusions about the impact of of Africans from a certain region or from a certain port um, on a different on a on a place like Louisiana and so um, we have um, these are all from the voyages database if you've not played in the slave voyages database you absolutely should it's a really important and fantastic um, digital humanities project that has been around for the last 20 years maybe more um, and allows you to create graphs like this one where we can get a sense of from if we're looking at ships flying the french flag which which there are only these. Um, these are only ships that arrive in Louisiana. So unlike other places, you're not getting ships from like Spain or, well, not Spain, but Portugal or the British or the Dutch. It's just the French slave trade to Louisiana. Um, and you can get a sense of the flows of um, men and women from the database itself. You can get a sense of Sorry, really quickly before I go to the next slide. What's great about um, the database is that uh, we're able to get a sense of uh, which ships will actually give us information about the breakdown of gender. And so we see here, like for the most, most part, we're looking at majority um, men on these ships, and that's not unusual for the slave trade. But we are looking at a significant, um, you know, 30 to 10 percent. Of, of those ships also are female um, or that we can sort of draw a conjecture that they're female. One of the things I talk about in the book are the ways that we actually can expand some of our understanding of what um, what genders, uh, what sexes, I think I'll say is more accurate in this context, what sexes are on these ships. If we look at the registers, if we look at the ways that they're calculating who is dying on the ship and who is not. As they look, if we look at who is marked in the register itself, even if in the margins, which um, there is a lot of marginalia, marginalia as I talked about in the book, uh, as having been pregnant um, when they were um, when they um, died on the voyage. Uh, so there are all. So even as this database is extremely important and um, exquisite in its intricacy. Um, there are also way, other ways that I try and posit that we can be looking at the slave trade and how we can understand um, a breakdown of, of, of sex among captives on the ships themselves. Uh, and then this last one is um, a look at the breakdown of ships that are coming from um, ports that are in, um, in the terrain of, of Senegambia. Uh, and so what we get to see here, um, which is what slave trade scholars um, have been grappling with when it comes to Louisiana thinking about histories of diaspora, um, is that, you know, there's this concentrated number of ships that are coming from Senegambia in particular. Uh, and so one of the things that we talk about, um, I talk about in the book, are the ways that, what role that might play in um, how the French are navigating slave trades. Um, in how they understand the logic of commodification and what's happening on the ships. Um, the slave trade from Senegambia, uh, if you search in this database again, I don't have it on this um, slide, but if you search in this database again, you would, could do a search that said, um, that search for slave revolts on ships. And the slave trade from Senegambia from Upper Guinea Coast is the um, slave trade flow that has the most slave revolts. So there's a lot of interesting things um, to think through. And one of the things I try and do um, in the book is, is think through what are the ways that this middle passage is a particular 
specifically violence passage for those who are gendered as women and girls? What does it mean to be gendered women and girl in this passage? Um, what does it mean? What it, how do we take seriously Horton Spiller's framing of ungendering and thinking about middle passages and slave trades? Uh, and what does it mean to come through this and land on the other side? Uh, one of the important facets of Louisiana and interaction between um, African and European uh, in this region is that it's not just African and European, it's African, European, and indigenous. And so um, chapter three and chapter four actually kind of overlap in sort of thinking through um, the experiences of those who are coming across the Atlantic, that middle passage experience, and how that overlaps with the experience of being in the 1720s, 30s, 40s, Louisiana, a world that is on native ground, so take Kathleen Duvall's framing, a world in which, just like they are in Senegambia, although not exactly like they are, the French are navigating diplomacy and geopolitics with Wolof entities, with British, with other people who are around the coast. Similar geopolitics are happening in, in the Louisiana context. It's just they're navigating these same things with the Natchez, with the Choctaw, with the Chickasaw, with the Petit Nation, who are, who are the smaller indigenous nations that are um, it, um, populating the, the, the Gulf Coast, with the British, who are next door as far as the French are concerned, um, in the Low Country, with the Spanish, who are too close for comfort as well. And so in this world of of shifting geopolitical entities and diplomacy, uh, African women um, and women of African descent land and are um, get caught in a history of commodification of um, of intimate violence that is that begins to attend their experiences, uh, and so. Uh, chapter four goes into what is that experience like of this early Louisiana space? Let me see if I have a good slide for um, early Louisiana. I think I have at least uh, a map. Let's do that one. I have a map. Um, we have the context of um, of early Louisiana and um, what it means to land as now with the status of slave uh, and uh, subject to slave owners and colonial officials in a different, completely different world from the African context. What does it mean to navigate that in a context where the French are themselves, in some ways, minority stakeholders in a much larger indigenous um, uh, confluence of geopolitics? And what um, what does it mean to uh, to try and find some space or meaning for security, autonomy, safety in this world? What are the ways your intimate practices shift and change? Your kinship practices shift and change? How do you how do we relate? Um, you know those who understand themselves to be women or girls uh, to a similar uh, to how how do they relate to um, those who understand themselves to be men and boys. What are the stakes uh, for um, Black men, for African men versus African women? Uh, so chapters four and five do a lot of sort of navigating that. Chapter four is sort of um, a way of setting up um, that context, particularly those earlier years, 17, 20, 30, 40s, and what it means to, um, what commodification means in a gendered context. And then chapter five um, gets into the ways that um, this gets taken up uh, by uh, African women uh, and uh, in some cases navigated, in some cases negotiated, uh, not always successfully, uh, but that this is in some ways the milieu that uh, those who have arrived must now figure out, and those who are born in, um, in Louisiana must now figure out how to navigate. So you have chapter five is Black Femme Acts Archives and Archipelagos of Freedom. Um, and in that chapter, what I try and map out are some of the manifestations of um, freedom practices that are burgeoning in these, in these earlier contexts that are uh, legacies of interaction with um, imperial regimes uh, from, uh, from across the Atlantic, from, from the crossing, but are also sort of fully from a Louisiana context that are in some ways really conditioned by the possibilities um, available uh, in, uh, in the French Louisiana world. And then the, um, the last larger chapter is um, about this transition to the Spanish era. This is a significant transition. 
the uh, Spanish bring with them um, institutions that enslaved women in particular, when enslaved people more broadly take, take immediate advantage of. Things like cuartación, which allows enslaved people to eventually um, negotiate a self-purchase price. Um, things like changing the rules for manumission so that now instead of having to um, go to your, go from your owner to the superior council to having your manumission validated by the governor and the intendant, now you can just go to a notary and have, a, um, have your manumission, whether it's a self-purchase or whether it's a free manumission from your owner, have that ratified by the notary. Uh, it, it changes uh, access to um, uh, to manumission as a possibility, uh, and this um, creates other kinds of um, um, opportunities and tensions as far as how um, enslaved women uh, and now free now growing category of free women of color navigate their kinship um, dynamics, navigate their intimate practices, navigate space in the town, which is you know, now growing larger. Uh, it um, adds uh, the slave trade reopens briefly. So now you have new um, dynamics entering into this broader Black New Orleans community um, and new connections to places um, like Cuba, um, which becomes uh, the, the heart of appeal. Like if you lose your case before New Orleans can build, oh, your case goes to um, Havana. Um, not often, um, often there's not a response when your case goes to Havana no response to your appeal, but that there are all these new layers of authority become avenues and stakes for enslaved people and free people of color to take advantage of. It also adds new tensions. So that's a lot of the chapter is about the way there are these significant tensions within um, families themselves or what we might in the 21st century think of as families to the extent that we actually can't assume biologically that people are family and that that has that same meaning and that in this world, um, thinking about um, chosen kin and I'm, this I'm drawing on both Dylan Penningroth's claims of kinfolk, but also um, thinking about um, black queer and trans work around chosen kin and chosen family. Uh, that framing actually becomes really, really significant and allows us to see the ways that that's very much a historical framing um, and also a, um, a, black, um, a, a black diasporic framing um, that we have been choosing kin for um, for years and years, and, and that's an important piece of, of strategies of survival and also strategies of truncating community, and we can talk about that. Uh, and then the book ends with just a brief dip into the 19th century, um, looking at the impact of the refugees who are expelled from Cuba from the Haitian Revolution. So this is 1809-1810, um, when uh, Napoleon invades Spain, he, uh, the Spanish retaliate by expelling French refugees from um, the Haitian Revolution from Santiago de Cuba and, and other parts of Cuba, and they go to New Orleans. Um, and this uh, is often the demographic that uh, when we're talking about 19th century New Orleans, um, scholars refer to when they think, when they talk about the influence of the Jean de Calure Libre or the French, Black, the French influence in the city or the Black influence in the city or all the freedoms. And one of the things I, one of the reasons I want to end there is, is to show that, yes, that's actually a significant piece in how the 19th century emancipation struggle proceeds in the U.S. and also more broadly, because there's still the rever reverberations of Haiti. But um, it's also just like the piece on top of a longer century of struggle for of thinking about what freedom is, what freedom means, what autonomy means, what safety means, what pleasure means um, for years and years and decades before. Uh, and so although um, there are iconic figures that come out of this moment, Henriette Delisle, Marie Laveau, iconic female figures, um, and iconic figures that historians have, have drawn on, Anna Kingsley, Rosalie Vincent, uh, it's also important to remember that um, you know, this is uh, the newer version of freedom struggles of a uh, of wicked flesh that is that is um, extends so much earlier um, in the period. So, um, so that's some stuff about the book. Um, there are, I'm sure, all kinds of other things that can be talked about and other um, questions that can be asked. But I am going to leave it there and stop sharing. Um, and actually open it up for some um, some questions from you guys. I could give Jessica a virtual round of applause and thank <laughs> you. And, <laughs> um, good luck with the rest of the term and congrats on such a beautiful book.
Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. Good luck with everything. If you need me, feel free to email me questions. If you feel like you have other questions from what I answered, all of that. So you guys have a great weekend. You too. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.